Well, first of all, tell me, how do you choose the tracks that are on version? Are they tracks you've been kind of covering for a while, working on your sets? No, I just, the things that I've always, songs that I've either always loved or always wanted to play out my DJ sets to like my crowd, which is more of a hip hop sort of soul crowd and not been able to for whatever reasons. And just, there's a song like Stop Me If You Think You've Heard This One Before that I've loved since it came out when I was 13. And there's a song like The Jam Pretty Green, which is even older, but I only just heard that for the first time like a year ago. So just songs that I loved that thought would lend themselves well to the arrangements and stuff that I do. What sort of contact have you had with um, all the original artists? Have you kind of sought a response or permission or anything? Yeah, I've had to go because I've changed the songs. If you just pick up a guitar and play a Coldplay song exactly like they do it, you don't have to get permission. It's like a you know, legal kind of thing. But if you change it like I have, you do have to go. So we've had to go to everybody and it's been really cool. Like it's been, you know, unanimously kind of positive. And some people have been more vocal and said like, hey, I really like your version of my song, which is really cool. Cool. Wasn't there a bit of a backlash from Smiths fans originally, though? In the I idea? think a little bit. I think because they're quite, I guess, in brilliance kind of inspires that kind of rabid fandom. And the Smiths just have it more than anyone else. They have the most sort of covetous fans. And that's actually the, a lot of the reason it took me a long time to get into the Smiths because all the people I knew were so like fervent against it, about it. I didn't really kind of know where to start. Like, what if I don't like them as much as Scott? Will they think like I'm weird? And then I just, uh, when it first came out, people were like, oh, what has he done to the songs, or this and that. And it's kind of like, if Morrissey and Johnny Marr are cool with it, like, you know, I'm sorry you don't like it, so just listen to the original, you know? Yeah, definitely. Let's talk about some of the more um, contemporary artists on there. You've got um, Amy Winehouse and Lily singing on there. Yeah. How did you first um, get to know them? Because you worked on their album too, yeah. as well. Um, I met Lily at a club, Notting Hill Arts Club in London, and, and uh, I met her about two years ago, and she was talking, about a year and a half ago, she was talking about her music, and uh, I think the first time I was just like, yeah, another girl with a demo, like, just what I need. And then I remember listening to it. She's quite shy, though, about it, actually, now I think about it. She's kind of mentioned the music, but then, like, quickly changed the subject. And then I... I kind of was talking the next time I could tell she had cool taste in music and just the influences she was talking about from like the specials to Dizzy Ross or Jay-Z. I remember listening to her demo and it had Smile and LDN on it and really just being like, wow, this is amazing. And I remember asking if she wanted to come to New out to New York to work. And then um, with Amy Winehouse, we met through a mutual friend that worked at EMI publishing this guy, Guy Moot, and uh, we just kind of hooked up. Why do you think the public's kind of fallen in love with those two girls in particular? Because they're quite kind of strong-minded, they don't fall into the traditional pop star yeah. mold. Well, I think the, the, at the bottom of it all is definitely the fact they're both really talented, they both write great songs. But I think, yeah, they are really refreshing to read about because they're so honest and they just sort of say what's on their mind in an era where it seems like everything that like a Shakira says probably gets filtered through seven PR people. Like there's something about something that just says, no, this is rubbish or I don't like her or whatever. How far do you see yourself as being kind of like making that crossover from producer to kind of star artist in your own right? Because right now there's obviously you and then Timberland as well has got his own right. um, thing out. He does star in his own videos though. Yeah. Uh, you haven't gone down that route. So um, how far do you see yourself going down that route? I think Timberland's a bit different because he does actually rap on the songs and he does things that are a bit more like sort of tangible. It's easier to say like, oh, I understand he's the artist, he's rapping. I guess I'm probably this record, you could only really classify it as an artist record in the kind of old school artist sense of um, like Quincy Jones and the orchestra producer arrangers in the 60s that used to like lead the band and do their hits of the day kind of thing and have some people vocaling or whatever. And then I guess there's a more modern tradition of like Chemical Brothers, Basement Jack, Staff Punk and Dance acts that like kind of are faceless. But I think it's like, you know, I'm not in the front of the stage like with the mic singing the song it's hard to put it together if you're not like kind of like some guy that reads liner notes i'm not the artist you know forever people thought i was singing stop me and not daniel merriweather but um I, it is my record in the way that i'm playing all the instruments it's sort of my concept producing arranging so it's kind of it's nice to ha be able to have that how do you feel as a producer when um a record that you've worked on doesn't get received so well. I'm thinking particularly Robbie Williams' Rude Box last year. Yeah. He produced Love Light, of course. Yeah. And um, that went down a bit better, actually. But um, yeah. how does that make you feel when albums kind of get slammed like that? Um, I just felt more for Robbie because I felt like people were just coming down and extra harsh on him. But um, 
Love Light's one of my sort of favorite like modern R and B productions I've ever done, and it's like as long as you're proud of it, you know. And there's the other song King of Bongo with Lily on it that I play out, and people, especially in America, have no idea who Robbie Williams is. I played any of those songs, and they're just people always like, "What the hell is that?" Like that's great, and or they kind of know his name, and they're surprised to see it. So, um, I think you can't worry about if something does well or not because you can't if you're in the creative process there's no way to account for taste and what the people are going to like so if you start ever tailoring it to that you might as well sort of writing songs for like the pussycat dolls or something songs that you're writing in the studio that like to make a hit you know what i mean would you work with Robbie again? I mean, do you know anything about his comeback? If he is yeah, no, he's, I mean, we speak quite a bit. And yeah, it's, I'm going out to LA next week cause for a gig and something else, and I said that we'd get it together for a few days and maybe play some music or something. What direction would you like to see him go in next year? I don't know. I haven't really talked about him, to him about what he wants to do, but I think it's quite evident he can sort of do anything, you know, so I'm curious to hear what he wants to do.